I want to encourage you today to us religion makes church and Christianity a routine Holy Spirit makes it a journey when you're with Holy Spirit it might be a similar service every Wednesday 7 15 it may be a same seems like same thing every Friday at 10 we have prayer but with Holy Spirit life is a journey without Holy Spirit it's a routine and very soon it could be a routine with seven thousand dollars receiving every month it could be a routine from visiting all the nicest and the coolest places in the world it could be routine to having twenty thousand followers on your instagram and having you know a brand that you finally your dreams are becoming a reality but all of that has a certain sense of cycle that doesn't give life but sucks life there's only one that gives life and that is jesus who said i came to give life he says Satan came to suck it out of you and if the only thing you have is your business, your dream, your idea, your good looking body, you know nice clothes, good car, nice rims, good vehicle, all of these things you know a good babe, good all the children, all of that good stuff, all of that, all of that actually takes life but it doesn't give life it only magnifies it does not satisfy Jesus Christ satisfies Holy Spirit satisfies that anything else comes into your life begins to magnify what God satisfied can somebody say amen you know and you you will see that when you when you are single and you're happy because of Christ you get married you get a little bit more happy most of you can say amen because you're not married but if you're happy single that means you can say amen but if you're lonely and you're single no matter who he she is six months seven months a year and that loneliness will slowly but surely will only increase everything you have inside only gets magnified by the success popularity and finances or anything in life what really satisfies is a relationship with Jesus Christ he said I came to give life and more abundantly the relationship that gives is a relationship with the Holy Spirit every other relationship demands from you your parents they're pretty demanding you're demanding people are demanding everybody around you says give me give me give me give me only Christ says I'm here to give you and when that relationship with Holy Spirit is not strong we are running on empty and we're like that one time that I came to church and you know and I had a I had no gas but I was so lazy to go to go to the gas station and I decided to use my faith you know and I came to church after church I got into my car and my dad reminded me somehow he knew that I didn't have gas he said make sure you go to the gas station but you know when you're young and disillusional I got into the car and somehow I started to see that the arrow on my gas started to go up without the gas station I was like the devil is a liar God is doing miracles but I didn't want to call my dad because I wanted to prove to him that I can get to the house first and then I could show to him how the arrow went up so I'm driving and I'm like oh my goodness this is a miracle but I'm kind of nervous because <laughs> I'm like this has never happened before I'm like I know you know Jesus being born from emerging that is like a miracle but I don't think God is going to be doing something incredible right now with me I have money and I'm not going to the gas station because I'm lazy I don't think God's going to really do a miracle but I was like man this is happening right in front of my eyes and so I passed the gas station I'm like no I'm not stopping by at the gas station I'm going to go and right on that highway as it goes up my heart my car stopped <laughs> I was like oh no so I pull over you know and the worst part is calling your dad what are you gonna say a miracle happened what happened to that miracle you know you're embarrassed you're ashamed and uh I couldn't call my dad and so I actually used every ounce of faith I had and I actually had the car started and I got to the house well I got to the gas station first filled it on I never told my dad about the miracle and uh but I realized same thing about life is many times you think you got it all figured out until there hits uphill and you realize you're empty and you can't go forward 
and that's why today you are here so that you can get refilled please I ask you that you you take time to receive from Holy Spirit you take time to receive from God during worship during the word remember without Holy Spirit life Christianity is a routine with the Holy Spirit it's an adventure it's a journey yes it might be same amount of people but it is not the same thing it might be you know for me like now when we go to a camp and by the grace of God we'll go again this weekend to um somewhere, somewhere close closer to Canada we'll take some people uh, with us but at the same time every single camp every single service for us it's an adventure it's a journey with the Holy Spirit can somebody say amen you are the greatest product of the Holy Spirit Holy Spirit loves us and he lives in us and he wants to work through us for the glory of God amen let's um, take a, a time to read one verse from the Bible and I'm going to continue from the topic that I mentioned last week we talked about much through abiding we welcome all the people who are visiting us for the first time uh, my mom's co-worker Erica uh, we welcome you and also Gabriella uh, Sylvia's cousin and stuff so welcome you and any other people that I didn't get a chance to meet so let's give a round of applause to all the people who are visiting us for the first time or for the second time or for the who knows how many times let's go to uh, John chapter 15 and verse 16 and it says the following you did not choose me but I chose you and appointed you that you should go somebody say go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatever you ask the father in my name he may give you I want to speak to us today on the title if you're taking notes a title of revival that remains revival that remains Gospel of John chapter 15 we've discussed a little bit last week when Jesus talked about the vine and the branches and the fruit kind of saying how we are the branches and Jesus is the vine and how bringing souls and developing a godly character is like that fruit that Jesus expects out of us we also mentioned last week that Jesus has this big mega vision and one of the reasons why he has this big mega vision is because he has a mega love for people meaning God wants everyone to be saved not only so that you know that the organization that we are connected to will be large and somewhat competitive with others but it's so the kingdom of God will take over the earth like God intended it to be it is our intent and our desire for our church to be the biggest church and the largest church we are competing in Tri-Cities against only one church and it's the church of the devil and as, as of this today, he has a lot more members than a lot of churches combined. And so our goal is to empty hell and to populate heaven. And we want to go as far as God can take us and as push as many people to do that as we can for the glory of God. Can somebody say amen? We want to see a lot of people saved. First, it's going to be this sanctuary, then other sanctuaries, then coliseums, then big stadiums. And we're going to see great things happen for Jesus Christ through us in Jesus' name. Can somebody say amen? and so that is kind of the vision and the desire of Jesus and that is the vision we have no luxury of having any other vision Jesus said in chapter 15 and verse 16 as we read he said I didn't you didn't choose me meaning for those people walking around say I was searching for God and I found him you're wrong uh, you were running from God and God was searching for you and found you and when God knocked on your heart you said yes and so that yes is your way of saying you've been searching for God last time I checked you and I were not searching from God wanted to do nothing with God even most of the testimonies of people who came to church the ideas are always I said no I didn't want to come and everything and then sometimes we get up and say man I've been looking for God <laughs> not really the Bible says we didn't choose God God chose us he created us and he found us he used different circumstances and events in our life to pull ourselves to him even if we didn't see his real fingerprints in them but then Jesus says not only I chose you and the reason why Jesus chose us is because he loves us he didn't choose us for any really other reason except because he loves us if he wouldn't choose us we would die in our sins and go to lake of fire and burn there forever if he wouldn't choose us 
because he loves us then we will most of us even not make it to the lake of fire we will already get burned by sin and satan and get devoured by curses shatter our lives because some of us we already know you don't have to have phd in business and masters in in teaching and p and maybe you know bachelors in this and that one thing you are born with the degree that doesn't die fast with you and me is we have an expert at destroying our life we're so good we can save ourselves the only thing we're super good at is destroying ourselves and so Jesus comes to help us he comes to save us from ourselves from our sin from the power of the devil he says I have chosen you and I'm so glad he did not based on my color not based on my appearance not based on my income not based on my past not based even on my potential but based on his love and love that is unlimited then he says not only I've chosen you he said I have appointed you appointed you another translation says I've ordained you means I have called you I have given you an assignment I've given you a purpose I have appointed you are you chosen by God that means you're appointed by God I have appointed you and we all know Jesus doesn't mention in this verse but because Christ appointed us he will also anoint us because Christ will always give his anointing to those who answer to his appointing see God's anointing God's power is not for butterflies goosebumps or rolling on the floor or just even experiencing some temporary relief God's power is his anointing is to support his appointing Jesus says I will send my spirit so that then my Holy Spirit will help you to bring people to Jesus Christ because Christ knew that to do God's appointing means to bring people to God it will be very difficult most of us will have excuses we will say I'm shy I'm afraid I can't speak English these people are not my culture I'm not fully educated I don't have a lot of I don't know a lot about Bible I don't know Greek Latin and Hebrew many people will say well people won't listen to me many people will say well I tried to invite somebody to God but they said no they're so busy in their sin so Jesus knows that in our own strength we cannot lift this big mission in our own power now some of us in here we have a very outspoken personality anywhere you are you just start conversations yet without Holy Spirit you're just a social person you can't make a difference because you're social some of us are very bold means you just come and you start a conversation with the new people and you're just so so bold and the rest of us are very shy whether you're bold or shy you must understand Christ called you for his purpose and you cannot use your shyness or your personality or your shyness to say well that is not for me because I am a shy person and the calling for me is to cut the grass at church I am not going to do the evangelism part no Jesus said everyone is appointed and for those who feel unequipped I'm gonna give my anointing for those who feel like they have gifts they still need my anointing because without my anointing you cannot make that happen somebody say amen. amen so anointing is for appointing and God's appointment requires God's anointing without Holy Spirit's anointing we cannot do this task if you look at the church in China right now and you look at the record numbers of people that are being saved you look at the persecution that is happening there people in China when they become Christians most of them probably will get kicked out of their jobs some people will actually be imprisoned yet the church is growing yet people are being saved and they say one thing about the China Christians is that when they evangelize they do not evangelize a lot of them do not have a very huge theological and a biblical education meaning they don't know probably half of the things you and I do yet they know a few things is when you go tell somebody about Jesus you are the only person most likely they'll ever hear about God and that when you do that you fully depend on the power that comes from above to help you and the way they witness is different because see they can't just come there and say do you want to accept Jesus he'll make your life better you can't say that in China because he won't make your life better you lose your job and you'll be in jail 
so you can't use the technique come to our church and then you feel better because in China that's not gonna work and in other parts of the countries in Iraq it's not gonna work and so the gospel has to be you have to come to Jesus because he died for you lived for you and when somebody says they're sick and they say we can pray for you right now and when they pray for the sick little girls a young man and young women they pray for the sick who are not Christians and people get healed and then people's hearts get open to the gospel of Jesus Christ anointing of God must be present when we share our faith with other people constantly rely and all of us know you can be with your relatives you can be with your close friends who know you so well and who trust you but you cannot convince them without the presence and the power and enablement of the Holy Spirit and somebody say amen so Jesus says that I've chosen you he said I have appointed you means with that comes the power of the Holy Spirit what did he chosen us for what did he appointed us for he says that you will go and that you will bear fruit this simply means that he gives us one assignment in life he gives us one direction in life he gives us one point to life and this point is to go and to bear fruit leaves are secondary the length of the shoots is not the primary objective the primary objective is that I will go and bear fruit to his name for evangelism to work for soul winning to work it must become the direction of our life not a department in our life for people to be saved in tri-cities it's not going to happen if salvation of people is a part of your life but not a point of our life for many people who are Christians to become Christians bringing somebody to Jesus is a part of their life meaning I am busy pursuing my career I am busy you know fulfilling all of my wishes and desires I am busy fulfilling my passions I am busy you know doing all of this and that I'm going to work I'm going to school and then if I ever have extra time if there is anybody ever who kind of forces himself on me that they have a big problem and I will bring them to church. I believe in evangelism but it's a part of my life just like many other parts that I have. My life is made out of parts and one of them is evangelism. Jesus didn't say, I've chosen you, I appointed you, go. Get married, have children, build houses, be great grandfathers go to your synagogue be good citizens and also guys do not forget help other people come to Jesus Christ that wasn't the objective Jesus never made bringing people to God as a part of a Christian's life he always said it's the point it's the direction not a department why is this very important you know as sometimes we go to uh, different churches and I get a chance to go to some amazing churches I get a chance to go to some talented churches as you saw these videos some churches where I mean you you see what they do and you are blown away and some big churches meaning a lot of members and you know and I'm always interested on the vision of the church what is the vision of the church and I used to ask people what is the vision of your church and now I stopped because you can see the vision of the church by looking at how people treat other people what they talk about and I remember sitting in the table recently with a group of uh, pastors, youth pastors and I was asking you know so kind of tell me what about evangelism, what about bringing people to Jesus and they started to tell me of people who got saved in their church. So I got so excited they started saying how this couple from Fiji they came and got saved and when I would ask them the events around these people's salvation and I've realized all of the events were accidental. It means all of the people who got saved at this wonderful fantastic church, the people got saved because an accident somebody invited them. This wasn't preached on the pulpit. This wasn't a prayer point. This wasn't a direction. This wasn't a teaching. This is a young people you are on this earth for this reason. Christ died for it. Christ commanded it. He gave us the Holy Ghost. Let's go do it. This wasn't the goal. It was we were doing our own thing and somehow they sneaked in and got saved. And I said we also had these things. When a guy came to our toilet to use the restroom over there, he was a backslider running from God and was fixing some security cameras around the neighborhood, came to use our toilet, we were preaching and right there in the other room, we didn't even know he was there, he got saved. He came back after that to just declare that he was saved. I'm like yeah that was great but that's not what our focus. 
that is not our joy our joy is in the fact it's our direction and it's our point in our lives in our ministries in our prayers and in everything we do and in all of the miracles that they point to that they're not an end to themselves can somebody say amen see when evangelism is a part of your life people who are lost hurting will always be an inconvenience when it's a point of your life there will be your intention there will be this is what you're for when evangelism and bringing people to Jesus is a department and people who are hurting people who are struggling will always be an interruption but they will not be your intention there will always be an interruption and not your intention when evangelism and seeing people come to Jesus Christ is just a part of our life guess what we're going to do with people who are lost we're going to shame them but when it is the point and direction of your life you're going to save them when I sometimes go to another church when you go to another church you can always know if the vision of the church to see people saved by this one thing how they treat new visitors sometimes you go into places and uh, you literally you sit there for two hours and nobody even once comes and says hi to you and you're sitting you're like really I get more welcoming in the restaurant and I get more welcoming you know with my enemies than you know this wonderful church that is so wonderful and so big everything with us is completely different the problem you will have in our church is that too many people will shake your hands that you will wish you would have had a sanitizer with you <laughs> the problem with us is going to be people will cloud on you people will try to tap you on the shoulder say hi you will feel a little bit socially awkward at first and you will say these people are just too much i would rather be accused of that than the other one you know how it started with us me and Ilya went to one local church here when we were still in high school when we just came to the united states it was a very large youth ministry it's a lot smaller now it's maybe about 250 kids I was invited from school to go there so me and Ilya jumped into his uh, Toyota, Toyota Corolla and the stick I still remember it like yesterday we went and we sat way on the back because we didn't speak well English we didn't know how to mingle pretty well and so we're sitting way on the back and 250 kids we kind of you know we stood out right away it's pretty obvious we either just arrived from the ship or we got shipped in a container <laughs> we looked different our hair was different everything about us was different fobs straight up and we were sitting there in the back and uh, and it was a wonderful group wonderful people Pre presence of God was a phenomenal and things were going great and in the service nobody I mean nobody came up once to shake our hand to say you know you're welcome or what is your name even when they had people get up and meet people around them they would meet around them and just miss these two <laughs> Russian strangers I remember driving from the youth service and I looked to Ilya and I said we will do whatever it takes but we will never ever allow that in our church and sometimes you will see some of us telling our leaders what are you doing standing here you go over there there's 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 a lot of new people you go meet them why because if our goal is to save people how can we ignore visitors how can a hospital reject the sick a funeral reject the dead and a restaurant to reject reject the hungry they will be out of business if our point is to see people saved it's going to be immediately evident with how we treat people who are hurting people who are lost or sometimes just people who are coming as visitors to our church somebody say amen Jesus never came to shame sinners he came to save sinners I think it was Billy Graham who said it's God's job to judge Jesus's job to save Holy Spirit's job to convict but it's our job to love Amen. we're gonna do our part because it's our point to see people saved that's why when you maybe it's your first time today you're coming in you're gonna be overwhelmed because a lot of people will come up and don't worry next week a lot more people will come up but it's only for one reason whether you are a Christian or you're not a Christian that is our goal and maybe that makes you feel uncomfortable I will live with that but if you walk out and say nobody came up to me and nobody even knew that I was here that I cannot live with because our deal the reason why I am here the reason why we are here 
is so that our city can know about the love of God. How can they know the love of God if they are not invited? And how can they know the love of God if they're invited but they're not hosted? Amen. And Jesus says that go and bear fruit and the part that he I want to underline today is that he says that your fruit will remain. What Jesus is meaning by that is that I want you not only to bring people to Jesus but what Jesus is saying that I want you to do it in such a way that it remains. I want you to do it in such a way that whatever you are doing will continue. From the beginning God had a vision and God had a passion for things not to stop with one generation. When Adam and Eve were created, God gave them a command. He says, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Fill the earth and have dominion. When Abraham discovered, you know, this relationship with God and Abraham had this faith in God, God right away said, you're going to be a father of many nations. And Abraham had a son. He passed that faith unto his son, a fruit that remained. We see when David was a king and he was a successful king and God says I want this kingdom to be passed on to a next generation. So when David is gone that thing is still continuous so that the fruit will remain. We see same thing with Elijah who was the prophet brought the fire from heaven and I mean he just did so many incredible things through the power of the Holy Spirit. When he died the power of the Holy Spirit on his life went on to another young man who did even greater things. We see Moses who, I mean everyone knows about him, they're making a movie about him, he's such a great man. Yet before Moses left to heaven, we know that the grace on his life was passed on to another young man. So Moses was gone but the mission still continued. When Jesus comes on this earth, his goal wasn't just to become the biggest and the most popular preacher. His goal was also to do his life in such a way that when he passes away, when he leaves this earth, and his mission will continue and that other men and women will do exactly what he did even more. And that's exactly what happened. God's goal was never preservation but multiplication. Jesus Christ is not interested in us preserving our faith. God is interested in us multiplying it. The parable of talents proves that. A man who buried his talent, he wasn't rewarded. But the man who multiplied their talent, they were rewarded. Which simply means it is the desire and the heart of God that my faith, your faith will not be preserved but it will be multiplied. That it will be multiplied. And this, we're not just talking about that you have children and your children, you know, are of the same religion as you. We're talking about that you as a believer, you as a Christian, see your task to see other people come to Jesus and that they do what you do. Bring other people to Jesus for the glory of God. Amen. You know, spiritual life really has three stages. We mentioned this a long time ago in our church. It's worth repeating. The first stage is the, when you're a child. The second stage is when you are a youth. And the third stage is when you are a father. A child is someone who needs care. It's hard to be a child because as a child you have to submit to someone who is older than you and submit to their advice, submit to their leadership sometimes and submit to their correction. You know and it's, it's easy to be a child when you're seven years old. But when you're spiritually 25 years old and you just gave your life to Jesus or you're trying to start your spiritual journey, it's hard to act like a child. Because you think because you're 25 and you have more degrees than thermometer that you somehow you got it all figured out. And sometimes we think because you know I have this success or I have this. I know everything about God. I know everything about Holy Spirit. I know everything about spiritual disciplines. And we feel like we walk around with this big head when in reality it's a big balloon. Empty full of air. And so Christ wants us to become children when we become saved. Meaning that no matter how old you are or how young you are, that you submit yourself to other people who can speak into your life and sometimes speak things that you may not want to hear. You're glad that your parents, you submitted to your parents when you were a child. When you took a razor and you thought it was a candy and they said, no, it's not a candy. But you were convinced that it was a candy. And they removed it and they saved your lips and they saved your life. And many of you will realize there are many accidents you will prevent if you will learn to be a child. It's hard to be a child, especially when you're 25 and you think you got your life figured out and you think you know everything. But if you submit yourself and you're saying, you know what, I'm going to be a child. I'm going to let my pastor, I'm going to let my leader or I'm going to let my parent to speak into my life. Even if I, I feel something so strongly but, but they're coming around, they're putting some other spin on these facts and they're saying, you know what, that, that may not be the best decision. I'm going to be the child and I'm going to believe that maybe the razor I'm holding is not a candy. And I'm so glad 
for my pastor in my life because it was easy for me I was about you know 14 years of age when my pastor started to kind of like you know get into my business a little bit you know any person that I would like from 13 till I got married you know my pastor said no and after a while it kind of felt really depressing you know I was like either I don't go to my pastor or I don't like nobody <laughs> you know because it was pretty obvious that you know pastor says no it's not right fight time for you and I was like no but I feel it I, I'm convinced I'm like 22 years old pastor this is my time my pastor knew something and I knew that if I want to be spiritually mature if I want to avoid mistakes in my life I have to be a child mistakes I've made in my life are the ones when I rebelled as a child successes that I have in my life today are the ones when I had somebody disciple me a little bit but after a child you become a youth a youth is when you learn to take care of yourself see a child somebody else takes care of the child a youth is when you take care of you it means you, you tie your own shoelaces you brush your own teeth you remind yourself that you need to wake up in the morning you remind yourself that you need to eat your breakfast youth spiritually means you encourage yourself youth means that you don't need always somebody else to pump you up or to tell you what you need to do you kind of know yourself that you don't need to do this you need to do this and many people like after they get used to this idea of somebody always telling them what to do encouraging them praying for them you know I pray for me right now I'm feeling kind of lonely I'm feeling kind of bad and it's fine when you're there but after a while you kind of have to learn to take your own hands one each day and you lay your hand on yourself and you pray for yourself and be like David who the Bible says at the lowest point of his life he didn't go to Samuel because Samuel was gone he says the Bible says and he strengthened himself in the Lord that's why David says the soul why are you so discouraged and disquiet in me because David knew that I'm no longer a child I need to learn how to feed myself encourage myself take care of my own mess and clean my own stuff somebody say amen and so you gotta be youth you gotta grow to be youth and most of us when we arrive at this point we have this sense of achievement we're like oh my goodness I am so spiritual I am so amazing I have not skipped my Bible reading for the past 25 days and this is such a big accomplishment I actually get up on my own my mother doesn't wake me up I balanced my own check but can you imagine how long it took me to get there I actually don't do this addiction you know bad things no more I am good well there's one more step and the step is when you become a father a father is when you take care of other people and usually the youth when you take care of yourself you develop this self-entitlement where you're like well if they want they need to learn to take care of themselves but children can't do that children is fathers and youth need to eventually grow into being sacrificial and taking care of other people a father is only person who has children father is not someone who has a lot of money father is not someone who's looking good father is not someone who has PhD father is not someone who has miracles father is only one you can't be a father unless you have kids unless you're willing to take care of someone else than yourself that is the father and spiritually what that means is this is that you grow up you submit yourself to another person that means and then you learn to submit yourself to the Word of God you learn to grow by yourself and thirdly you learn to realize that the real growth is when you take care of other people fruit that remains meaning you become a father remember when prodigal son came back home you know he was let's say he was 25 years old but he finally became a child at 25 because until then he was a baby because he was doing whatever he wanted to do he never listened to his dad and at 25 when he finally kind of got burned a little bit he became a son, child he said like, he submitted himself but the other son was a youth he took care of himself pretty well he I mean he did everything by himself and the youth was so offended and he didn't want to help the child his other brother because he's like well he messed everything up he's such a mistaker he makes so many mistakes I can't believe he needs to learn on his own but the father took care of the child because see the young man had never grown to be a father we got to learn to be a fathers if you can show that statistic what happens when one person brings people to Jesus and what happens when a person who wins 10,000 people every month to God let's say brings 10,000 people to Christianity it will take them 60,000 years to bring the whole world to God so that's a lot now uh, go go back go back so 10,000 people every month let's let's face it let's pushing it <laughs> in our church we focus one <laughs> 
<laughs> if we do one a month, that's gonna probably, we probably need to live eternity here before we see six billion, but people are multiplying. And so 10,000 people a month, that's a lot. Six, 60,000, I mean, we only had, was it 2,000 years since the birth of Jesus? 60,000, that's a long way to go. But the statistic says that if a person brings two people every month, somebody say, I can do it. And teaches them to do the same will win the whole world in 30 months. So that's what Jesus is saying. I want you to go bear fruit and I want you to let your fruit remain. It means teach the people to do the same. That's why Apostle Paul says to Timothy, he says, whatever I tell you, tell to other people. Make sure you tell to people who can tell to other people and that they can tell to other people and that they can tell to other people. So it gets to some people in Washington State in Pasco in 2014. And I'm so glad the link wasn't broken. Our goal is not to just we win as many people but the people we bring to Christ that they immediately begin to understand the mission on their life to help others come to Jesus Christ. To become those fathers in Jesus name. Amen. Guys God doesn't want us to be Elijah's. Elijah, Elisha was the one that died and he had anointing in his bones. You know what that means? That means anointing was never passed on to the next generation. It died in his bones. They threw a dead man on Elijah and Elisha's tomb and the dead man came to life. What would have happened if that anointing wouldn't stay in his bones but went on to someone else? Not only one person would be come back to life. Hundreds and thousands. Why was the anointing that was double on Elisha stayed in Elisha? Because Elisha was anointed. Superman. But Elisha lacked the father's heart. Because when his servant made a mistake, he put leprosy on him. Now fathers don't do that. Prophets do that. Fathers don't do that. Jesus was greater than Elisha. And all of his disciples, some did corny things, some really foolish things. And Jesus rebuked them. Jesus encouraged them. But Jesus, you never see Jesus saying, Peter, I give you cancer. John, leprosy. This guy, dead. <laughs> Drop dead right now. We don't see Jesus ever cursing his disciples though they made mistakes. Jesus on the opposite, he came back from the dead and he saw them returning to their old life and he, what did he say to them? He says, come on Peter, I got breakfast for you. He didn't say, come on Peter, I cannot wait to put leprosy on you for betraying me. He didn't say, come on Peter, I cannot wait to just send you to hell for what you did and have you join your friend Judas over there. He didn't do that because see a real mentor is not someone who can just pull the potential out of people but who can deal with people's mess. If you cannot deal with people's mess, you cannot be a father. If you cannot deal with people's mistakes, with people's shortcomings, with people's weaknesses, you, that is the part that requires on our end to do the part of bringing people to Jesus Christ. Come somebody say amen. amen. Fruit that remains, revival that remains is we're going to bring people to Jesus and most importantly we are going to disciple people. Our vision in the church is evangelism. Our strategy is discipleship. Our vision is to see people come to Jesus. Our strategy is our home groups. This is a strategy. Please understand, I'm not just preaching a sermon today. I am building a direction of our church. We're not just simply promoting, you know, just because, well, we have to, to take 35 minutes. And so some, somebody has to say something. <laughs> and so we have to find something. That is not the goal. We have a mission here. We have an assignment. And whether you realize it or not, but each service, we are brainwashing people. <laughs> because we've had a lot of junk in our trunk. A lot of junk that simply says everything is about me. My life is about what I can get. My life is not about bringing people to Jesus, but it's about me. And we want to take the soap of God's word and wash that out of our mind. That we think and we pray for the things that matter to God. And as we do that, God in return is going to do the things that matter to us. I'm going to put this verse one more time. Baby, if you can put this verse one more time. The verse that it says, Jesus says, I've chosen you. I've appointed you to you go and bear fruit and that your fruit will remain. Now listen to this. That whatever you may ask the Father in my name, he may give you. It's interesting how Jesus puts answer to your personal prayer at the end. 
Can I ask you a question? How answer to prayer comes after the answer to our call? Most of us, God calls us. And God says, can you go, can I love people through you? Can you raise people for me? You hear the call, but most of us don't answer it. God says, when you're calling, what if I would treat your prayer like you treat my call? What if when I call and I say my heart is breaking because the world is going to a lake of fire and I did everything I could so nothing that happens. Could you please give me a hand? He said, God, I hear you. I know, I know, but I'm just kind of shy. I have got a lot of other stuff. You, you don't understand, God. It's kind of it's kind of complicated here in 21st century. The new iPhone's coming out, the Instagram, the Facebook, the Twitter, the YouTube, and all these funny videos, the cat videos on Facebook. You kind of have to catch up with it, God. You don't understand the school, and the boyfriend, the budget, my car, the, the flat tire. God, you, you, you don't understand. You know, we can get to this, but let's take time. And then you come up, it's like, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. And God looks at what you're crying about and, and God sees how you're treating his cry with indifference. Not always. It's not always theologically correct. But I'm going to on a limb to say, the way you treat God's call is the way God treats your prayer. That's why Christians always have this question. Why does God not answer my prayer? Can I ask you a question? Why don't you answer his? Why doesn't God answer my cry? Why don't you answer his? It's interesting that Jesus said, I'll answer your prayer after you answer mine. Jesus said, and then you can ask whatever. And the Father will give you. Why? Because whatever He asked, you gave. God is not asking for something that's needed for heaven. He's asking for something that's needed for people. I want to challenge each one of us, including myself. People always complain in our church, a night prayers especially. How come we spend 95% of our whole night prayer praying for souls, for revival, gifts of the Holy Spirit, healings, home groups, leadership and everything. And then we take two minutes to pray for our needs. Why are we praying for the world but not for ourselves? Why are we praying for three cities but not for our needs? If we show to God we care what you want, you don't have to pray very long for your personal needs after that. You can sometimes even say, Lord, it's in your hands. God will treat my prayer similar to the way I treat His call. Guys, you can't trade God. I know that sometimes in mercy, God will answer even if we reject God. God always promises to hear your prayer. But He doesn't promise to always answer your prayer. As a Christian, that is connected. How do you answer God's call? You may say, well, that's not fair. Okay, let's, let's not get all super hyper spiritual here. How many of you have somebody that you asked to do something for you through a text message and then you ask them again and then you ask them again but they never replied but then they needed something and they needed something right away so they didn't send you a text message they called you did you pick up the phone and if you did were well, you're like oh yeah I'm dropping everything I'm doing I'm gonna go right there and help you anything else you want french fries to go with that Oh, of course not. No, you're like, um, I'm kind of busy right now, even though you had nothing going on and you were literally praying, what can I do right now? Why? And it's not because you're revengeful. It's because it sort of works like that. It's a relationship. You know like that. And when the person will begin to reply to your text messages or they begin to reply to your requests, your heart immediately somehow just kind of just opens like that. And you're like, yeah, anytime. Yeah, I can loan you my car. Yeah, I can give you this. I can give you a hand with this. I can give you anything else. I can help you with that. Yeah, I can get off work a little bit early and go help you with the yard. I can help you with this. I can help you with that. Why? Because there's that in a relationship. That's how things work. God says, I'm in a relationship with you. I love you. That's why I've chosen you, but I love people. That's why I appointed you. Go. 
make disciples go raise other people up I know you're busy but please understand you made yourself busy make yourself a little bit less busy make this a priority and then when you call on me I'm here I'll pick it up I'll answer the prayer I'll step in I will meet you at the point of your need a lady who started a charismatic movement called Foursquare Churches Amy McPherson she was dying out of an incurable disease and God spoke to her to give her life as a woman to the preaching of the gospel at that time woman preaching was not acceptable I mean women's rights were just picking up in the United States for a woman to preach it was not good and she did not want to preach she said I don't want to preach I don't want this whole God thing I don't want to preach to other people I don't want it but she was dying out of incurable disease and she was holding on as long as she could she kept begging God to heal her and God says the moment you say you will give your life to the gospel I will heal you right before hours the doctor says you got hours and she surrendered right there in the spot in the hospital healing power of God came she got up from her bed and started to preach the gospel. Now you may say, hmm, so God just doesn't give without strings attached. He does. Just He loves people so much that He wants to use us to love them. And He says, I'll answer your prayer. But I also have a request. It's not a big request. I want to love through you. I want to use you. I want to touch people. I don't want people like Robin Williams to commit suicide. I want them to discover life. I don't want them, people like Myra to live in depression. I want them to find life. I don't want people like him and her to die. I love them too much. I see their tears. I'm sending you, please do something about it. And the moment you say, Holy Spirit, if you help me, I will go. Then your prayers, your needs, you say, Lord, and God answers and even if he doesn't right away you trust that he hears and you trust that he will meet your needs at his will and at his time can somebody say amen